I'm sure that we'll have people uh, still strag straggling in uh, with the, uh, the rain delays and everything. I, I know it was a difficult time for many people on their commute. I'm uh, David Pumphrey. I'm a senior advisor in the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. And it's really a great honor to be able to uh, moderate this discussion with uh, Dr. Faridun Fesharaki. Uh, Faridun and I have known each other for many years. Would you say, Faridun? Is that a good estimate? So we probably don't want to say many, many years. Um, and I feel like um, I have really learned so much about energy markets from Faridun, his knowledge, and, and watching his practice and his work grow over time to the point where he really has a global reach. He started focusing in, in Asia uh, markets, was a leading expert on Asia markets when nobody real, really seemed to care too much what was happening in China and other places, and has now moved his vision to really encompass the, the whole world. And I think that's um, appropriate for the discussion that we're having because he can really bring to this discussion um, that perspective, I think he's probably been how many times around the world in the last year? Several times, I, I think. Talking to leaders in uh, energy markets about their perceptions of what's changing, what's happening, where things are headed. And that's why we thought, and we, we have fair doing eh, maybe once a year, and it's always a question of what to select for the topic for him to talk about, because there's so many opportunities. So he's come and he's presented discussions on uh, India and China to a, a packed house like this, global energy oil markets, global uh, gas markets, um, Iran and Iran sanctions. So there's so many different things we could choose. But we thought, given the focus that's now in this town on the question of what does it mean to see the U.S. situation changing so rapidly in terms of our gas production and our oil production, that to have him comment on that. So this is a little different presentation than he might usually give, which would be very heavy laden with statistics and numbers and projections. This one, I think, is more his observations of uh, what's happening and the implications of those things. It also ties in nicely with uh, the work that has been finished, uh, the project that Sarah Ladislaw had led on our uh, geopolitics of uh, the energy revolution that we just published recently, the new energy and new geopolitics. And I, um, I think it will be interesting to see the extent to which Faridun, who hasn't actually had a chance to review our copy, uh, agrees with us uh, in terms of the conclusions in that study. It's also, I think, a, a special moment for me because this is uh, likely my last uh, opportunity to host a session here at CSIS, and I can't think of a better session to have be my last one than one with uh, uh, Faridun. So Faridun, if you'd like to take the floor. Thank you much, uh, very much, Dave. I'm uh, very happy to be here again. And uh, honestly, the reason that I picked this time is because I know he's retiring next week. And I wasn't sure whether Frank is going to let me into the building after he's yeah. gone. So, <laughs> so sort of, uh, I thought this is an opportunity to come here uh, and uh, see Dave in uh, the last week in uh, being at CSIS. Uh, he has been retiring a few times, so we don't know whether there will be additional retirement parties. Uh, but uh, I don't think he can separate himself totally from the, this business. So uh, from wherever he's sitting, he'll be his hands and arms and legs will be all over the place. Uh, as Dave says, uh, the presentation today is about uh, what is the meaning of the U.S. as an energy superpower for the rest of the world. Uh, for us as consultants, uh, this is the uh, best thing since sliced bread. I mean, you know, unbelievable. Not only is happening in the U.S., but everything that the U.S. can produce and export has to go to Asia. That's wonderful. And none of it is going to go to Europe, a little bit maybe to Latin America, almost nothing to Africa, a little bit maybe to the Middle East, but mainly it's going to go to Europe, so, to, to, to uh, Asia. So it is a... Uh, Fortunate that um, we are the big fish in that pond, and so a lot of new business, a lot of new concerns about what is possible and what is not possible. So I want to start first by defining what I mean by uh, superpower. I don't have a screen in front of me, so or oh, that one. Okay. 
So some of these things are obvious, some of them are not obvious to many people. And I must say that, you know, I am associated here with CSIS as a sort of uh, think tank, but I am very wary of the too much geopolitics in the Washington area because a lot of people talk about these issues and don't understand what happens actually in the oil and gas markets. A lot of conclusions are faulty. And uh, I think all of us remember that as soon as the uh, Crimea crisis began, everybody called and said, why don't we just sell some cheap gas to uh, sort of Ukrainians and be done with it? I mean, simply people just don't understand how these markets work. And uh, some of those folks coming, I think it was a Lithuanian prime minister begging President Obama, give me some gas, as if he has gas and he can give it. And uh, as if it can be turned on and off. I mean, this is all sort of um, so much misunderstanding about how the markets work. So let me define you from point of view of us, what is makes the US superpower. One is that there is an OPEC size increase in production uh, between light crudes, and we have to distinguish, I'll distinguish between light crudes and condensates. Total additional production by next year would be probably equal to the total Kuwaiti oil production. So this is a substantial addition which has come to the United States. US becoming the largest, is already a largest use of condensates in the world. Many of you may not know what condensate is or do not care, but it is very important. Condensate are the liquids which are extracted from gas. Some natural condensates are produced, but the value of condensate is that it is very, very light, and it produces a lot of NAFTA as a feedstock for petrochemicals, particularly advanced petrochemicals. So, Number one in the world has been Guitar, 800,000, 800,000 barrels per day a year. And uh, number two would have been Iran. And then number three and four, I think, are in uh, the two producers in Australia. That's a couple of hundred thousand barrels per day. So what's happening in the US, the volumes that US puts together is probably going to be more than all of them combined. Okay. And I will tell you the significance of this is very great because uh, we hope that Adam Siminski is going to differentiate between crude and condensate. And people say, well, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Nobody cares about condensate in the United States. Nobody wants it. But the rest of the world wants it. Asians are desperate for it. And pay a huge premium, $25, $30 a barrel more than what the US producer is receiving today. So, I'll come back to the condensate issue when I get to Asia, but it's a very significant issue. Then, among the top three LNG producers uh, by 2020-22, may become number one, uh, we don't know. Uh, they are um, suicide bombers in the US LNG industry, people who want to produce the gas, but they have no idea where it goes, actually, sort of. so. All the money that you remember people lost on the regas, they're going to lose it now on LNG business, but except multiplied by 10. Since the regas terminal costs you a billion, a liquefaction costs you 10 billion. So there is a lot of uh, misreading. I'm continuously amused by people who believe that there is a non ending demand. Already in Asia, it's difficult to sell LNG. All the people who have bought US LNG have not been able to resell it. We, uh, our numbers show that 35, 38% of the firms sales and purchase contracts signed by the US, the buyers, many of them are middlemen. If there's international companies, trading houses, they don't use it themselves. They have to go resell it. So I've got two sales in the business. Between 35, 38% of it as of today is still unsold. So if they haven't been able to sell it, then how come a new player suddenly emerges who has never even traveled outside the US and be able to find those markets? So a lot of misunderstanding, but US will be the top three and may become number one. We don't know. This is happening by 2022. Top LPG exporter in the world by end of next year. This is real, this is today. That for decades, Saudis were the largest LPG exporter in the world. 
four or five years ago, the Qataris became number one after the big LNG projects. Now Abu Dhabi is number two, Saudis are number three, and Iranians are number four, LPG exporters. By the end of next year, the US will become number one. This is significant, very significant, because LPG business doesn't require a permit from anybody. These are refined products based on the classification. Exports are permitted. You don't have to spend $10 billion to build a liquefaction plant. You have to build the terminal to be able to get it out of the country. And we are just at the first wave of beginning of the curve. It's remarkable. The price of the US LPG based on Mount Bellevue hitting the Asian market is 30% today less than the Saudi price. So already the prices are clashing. It is not possible to have two prices at destination. These prices have to converge. And the way it will converge is that the Saudi price has to come down to match the US price. This, the future of it is already set in motion. But it's so new and it's so amazing that suddenly, from almost zero, the US becomes so big. Now, the rage these days in Asia, particularly in China, is PDH plants. PDH plants are people who use propane to produce propylene. And I've heard so much about PDH, I've decided to exchange my PhD for PDH because it seems to be much more profitable these days. These PDH plants are now, many of them are based on what can be gotten from the US. So there is a whole huge new flow from US to China of LPG, which hasn't even started. Very dramatic. Then, of course, the US became last year the largest exporter of refined products. This year, still, either number one or number two, Adam can tell. But uh, the US refiners are having such a great time. I mean, it is remarkable. Everybody in the world is suffering. People with the best refineries in the world, Korea, India, they are barely making their costs. And these folks in the US are enjoying it because of the crude discount. Now, yes, they are also smart guys. And they run the refineries well. And independents in the US are pretty uh, sort of uh, savvy producers. But it is the crude advantage which makes the difference. And we have to anticipate how long is the crude advantage. We'll continue. That depends on whether we can export crude or we cannot. But it can disappear very quickly, and uh, fortune can disappear and become a major challenge. Also, the poor performance of the Latin American countries in building refineries is a boost. You can export gasoline to Latin America and diesel to Europe and still escape all the problems that the other people have uh, in the refining business. Uh, but this is what makes US the largest export of refined products today in the world. And it is something which can continue for a while longer, although the demand in the US is either flat or slightly declining. Now, uh, the US will also emerge as a major petrochemical exporter by 2020. This is ethane-based petrochemicals. This is not based on NAFTA cracking, based on ethane. And that becomes a very, very big number. Many people are coming. Basic ethylene petrochemicals to be done in the US, but the sophisticated petrochemicals still require NAFTA as feedstock. And of course, the U.S. is a major coal exporter, has always been, and uh, the chances of uh, coal is back in fashion, you know, by the way, we, must, we have a golden age of coal coming back. And we have uh, everybody, including the Japanese, but also all over the world, turning back to coal. Coal, uh, you can clean it up if you don't have to worry too much about the carbon. Certainly in terms of pollutants, you can make it as good as anything else. Uh, so, the U.S. still has a, a bigger role to play on coal, but uh, I'm not focusing on that. I'm going to focus on the um, 
uh, oil and gas issues. Let me go back to the condensate story. In the US, the uh, refiners, they will fight tooth and nail against exports of crude. They will fight harder than the chemical producers fight fought against exports of um, natural gas. That battle on natural gas export is already lost. Exports will happen. And of course, uh, a lot of permits are being given, but permits being given doesn't mean the project will get done. Because in the US, you have DOE, non-FTA permit, you have a FERC permit, but you have a major permit has to be given by Adam Smith. The economics doesn't work, you can't export it. Many of these guys will not get Adam Smith permit. Because once they get the permit, they think it's a slam dunk. It's not a slam dunk. Still, you have to find the customers. And as I said, the big boys, which have already bought and signed firm contracts, cannot sell their volume. So why would I believe that somebody else would go and sell the volume? I have to keep that in mind. But the condensate story is a very different story. The refiners will fight not to allow it to be exported because this is their future. Without that, there is gonna be a very, very tough environment. So what is crude, what is condensate? Uh, in my definition, what works, and this is, please Adam, take note, 48 degree and above, make it condensate, nobody cares. 48 degree, 45 to 48 degree, probably a third of the industry cares. Below 45 degree, they all care. Nobody wants anything to go out. So since actually the US crude is not very important crude, tight oil, nobody wants it. There's plenty of crude like that available in the market. Plenty. Nigerians who have been pushed out of the US market, they are selling the crude and they can't get it to uh, get the market. So, it is not that this crude is now, people are dying to get it, but people are dying to get condensate. Now you can export the condensate in two different ways. You can export it directly as condensate, or you can split it in the United States itself and create, it gives you 70% NAFTA as a petrochemical feed and 30% of other fuels, including diesel, kerosene. Four months ago, zero plans in the US for condensate splitter. Today, four or five projects are firm, and five are in discussion. Of course, everybody wants to export NAFTA to Asia, so they have to talk to me, or they want to export the condensate to Asia, they have to talk to me again. So this issue is very, very high priority for us, because in Asia, you have many people, at least five condensate splitters are under construction with no condensate attached to them. And condensate is not like crude, that you can just go and buy it from somebody else. You have the Gataris, seven, 800,000 barrels per day, 400,000 barrels per day from Iran, and two, 300,000 barrels per day from Australia. That's it. There are no big volumes of condensate available anywhere else. And then you're looking at one to two million barrels per day from the US, depending again on how we put the definition. So those guys who are building the splitters are becoming desperate in getting access to condensate. What do they pay for the condensate? The prices that the Gataris charge today are Dubai plus two. So actually it gets crude, Dubai crude price. The Iranian prices are similar maybe a couple of dollars less because they are, don't have the marketing network as such, but it is almost crude price. So the people who would sell it outside will get um, WTI brand differential plus what the discount on the condensate in the US is, which is right now running about 12 to $15 a barrel to WTI. So it's about $25 extra money. It's a huge, huge boost for the US producers. Now, if you can't export it, then you have to split it in the US. And if you have to split the US, it costs a couple of hundred million dollars, with 150, 200 million dollars each. But uh, most of the people who have the condensate have never even traveled outside the US. They don't know where to go. In fact, 
one would have anticipated that the best thing is to go and find the Asians who want to bring them to the U.S. and make investments. Investment in the U.S. is great because you invest, you actually own the stuff, and you get a free green card, too, on top of it. <laughs> so a lot of people can be persuaded to come, but you have to know who to go to, and they don't know. So that aspect has not happened yet. And so much of these guys are now, they're building in anticipation that they cannot export, but if the exports take place, then there may be uh, no need for these splitters. Because certainly those who are building the splitters outside would much prefer to get it. And exporting uh, condensate, which is a very light crude, could be done in the usual, same style ships. It's no big, big deal. But once you make it to refined products, then you have to export each of them in smaller ships and segregated tanks. So it would be a very different story. So the definition of the U.S. as superpower, in our view, are these numbers that I have uh, put in front of you. Now, there is a, an issue to be discussed about the longevity of this. And I think this is what Dave mentioned in terms of the study that CSIS has done that I have yet to read. But longevity of some of these projects are in, in question. There would be a peak level Certainly on the liquid side, now is the peak 2018, 20, 22, 25, we don't know. Honestly, nobody knows. It's not that people are hiding it, because it's just so new, people don't know. Recently, some of the Marcellus drilling yields incredible results. People are finding so much more uh, shale and the liquids from Marcellus that nobody expected. Uh, people continue to innovate, coming up with new technologies, uh, and Things may surprise us, but at the moment, prudent assumption is that to see that on the liquids, there is a limit. On the gas side, I think plenty of gas will be made available. But of course, Henry, how prices would have to go up. We don't know how far. Uh, we think at least six, but it could be seven or eight by middle of next decade. Who knows? Uh, I am much more confident about my crude oil forecast than about my Henry Hub forecast. Because crude oil forecast, crude oil market has bosses. The world cannot afford too high, the world cannot afford too low. But uh, in Henry Hub, it's really a free market, and free market is very hard to forecast. Right? So we don't know what's gonna happen. However, I think that the continuation of exports of LNG uh, at the extent to the, that we're looking at, I think is sustainable for a long time. LPG is sustainable also. So only, I would say, my, my question mark would be on, uh, on the liquids, whether the liquids can be maintained at that level or not. And again, petrochemical part, the ethane-based petrochemicals also can continue as is. So <clears throat> this is my definition. Now, impact on Europe, actually uh, more coal exports to Europe. And uh, while I expect that a little bit of LNG will go to Europe on an so opportunistic basis, if today you take the European prices of $7.50, a bit under $8 for uh, uh, the hub prices in the UK, and you want to get a US producer to export LNG to, US, to, to Europe, they will be losing money. So when people say, well, let's produce it and sell it to Europe, no. Or people say, well, actually, let's lift the sanctions from Iran so Iranians take uh, natural gas to Europe. That's also nonsense because the price in Europe is too low. Until the prices in Europe justify it, <clears throat> the Iranians are not buying gas at nine, ten dollars a million BTU from Turkmenistan. They build a pipeline without sanctions, and all the way bring it to Europe to sell it for 750? Makes no sense to anybody. So the problem in Europe is not dependence on the Russians. The problem is that their prices are too low. It's weak, declining economies. That's not supporting the LNG projects or pipeline projects. I think if the Russians hadn't built the pipeline, they wouldn't build it today. But the money is sunk. The money is gone. So when the money is gone for them, this is still the natural market. And uh, all this speculation that I read, uh, I find it comical, 
Europe has to buy from Russia. That's it. There's nothing we can do about it until 2030. For now, we have to continue. And uh, I need to say that, you know, sort of, uh, I don't think what the Russians are asking from Ukraine is unreasonable. They have a rack price. The rack price is $13.40. They ask everybody the same price. They ask the Chinese the same price, it's Germans the same price, and then they will discount it to you based on your alternative. Ukraine's alternative is about $16 gas. There's no alternative. So if you're nice to me, then I can give you a discount. If you're my enemy, then why should I give you a discount? I wouldn't give you a discount. And part of the discount was related to the use of the port facilities in Crimea, which, by the way, is mine now. I don't have to pay you anything. So uh, why would I end up uh, giving you a discount? So uh, I think eventually they will come down and give a lower price. But I don't think we need to uh, vilify them as this is the, the gouging the Ukrainians they charge. You no, know, if today we take any LNG from, say, Qatar to Poland or to Slovakia and send it to uh, Ukraine, it'll cost them $3 more a billion BTU than the Russians are asking for, the rack price. The contract that Poland has with Qatar is about $14, 15 million BTU at $100 oil. So these are not the kinds of things that really sort of realistic. Realistically, US gas has very limited application to Europe. One thing that the US is important uh, for Europe is exporting diesel. And uh, as long as the crude advantage is in the US, Europe will be receiving diesel. And by the way, the Russians are pouring in diesel into Europe, overwhelming the American exports because they're next door, and they want to be in the European market. And all the companies are either directly state-owned or quote-unquote indirectly owned by the powers to be in uh, Russia. So this uh, diesel importance in Europe will also gradually disappear, but uh, it is there today. Impact on Russia, you know, uh, there is no real big impact on Russia, except that the LNG projects, which the Russians are planning, get impacted by the US LNG projects. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, have not been announced yet, so uh, it will come out in the next few weeks, the Japanese government has decided that um, they don't like the Russians anymore. And, uh, all of the LNG projects that they have promoted for 10 to 15 years, they don't want to promote it anymore. That's the Vladivostok LNG project. This is the Sakhalin 1, Exxon Mobil, Rosneft, and Sodeco project, and the Train 3 of Sakhalin 2. They have been working so hard to, to promote them. Now suddenly, the political bosses says, Americans tell us Russia is bad, so we don't want to buy it anymore. So we asked them, so what is your mission now? Mission is Alaska. That's the mission. So the Japanese companies will be lined up and will receive JBIC funding and will begin to look Alaska. Now we can all uh, speculate uh, whether the Alaskan economics, how it is, and I have my views, but there will be definitely a big push by the Japanese government into that. This is sort of, this is one of the casualties of uh, Ukrainian crisis, which actually means a lot to, uh, to Russia. But the big competition is on the LNG side. And of course, so the US is a competitor for uh, supply of refined products to, to uh, to Europe, but I think it's a losing battle with the Russians. They are sitting there, they have their own crude, and they next door, and they will continue to come in uh, in a big way. Now, what is the impact on the Middle East? Uh, of course, uh, you know, so many of these geopolitical geniuses in Washington, they all uh, talked about as soon as the US production of oil goes up, the Exports from the Middle East will go down. Well, I have news for you. Exports from the Middle East are going up, not down. 
and it is related to a number of factors. Uh, Venezuelan crudes are heavily pushed into Asia. There are term contracts of almost 500,000 barrels per day for Venezuelan crudes in India between Reliance and SR. There, is, there are 300,000 barrels per day going to China today, but a new refinery jointly with PDV is being built for 400,000 barrels per day of 17 degree crude. Expensive refinery, very difficult. And of course, Venezuela has no money to pay, so you have to discount the crude. You discount the crude somewhere in the range of um, 10 to 20 bucks, I can't tell you the exact number, but in that range to pay for it. So now, if WTI Brent differentials are wider than that number, actually Venezuela will be better off. But if we go to our expected structural WTI Brent differential of four or five dollars, then these will have cost Venezuelan people a huge amount of money. But you can't undo these things. If Mr. Maduro goes, you can't undo it. You've signed contracts, you've committed. Major investments are already in the works. So I expect that this will continue. And of course, please remember that Venezuelan oil production is not going up. So if it's not going up, then whatever goes out has to go out from somebody's imports. And of course, that somebody's import is the natural market which the US is. So then, of course, the, the issue of uh, Middle East exports, which have medium heavy crude, not really heavy crude, what the US wants, US refineries need really ugly crude. 20, 21 degree API and lower, that's what they really need. Middle East crude is not heavy enough. However, it's better than nothing. And certainly if you have to blend it into the existing uh, light streams to feed it to the cokers in the US, that would be okay. 50% of the coking capacity of the world is in the United States. And they need heavy grades. So, the need for the Middle East crudes have gone up, Saudi production exports have gone up, Kuwaiti exports have gone up, and that becomes heavily dependent in our view on what happens with uh, additional imports from Canada. Canadian exports to the US mixed with the US condensate. This is bitumen mixed with condensate, which uh, Canadians have uh, these uh, beautiful terms they've invented, the dilbits. The dilbits come at 20, 21 degree API range and they are ideal feed for the cokers. They take the liquids out and put the uh, bitumen inside the coker. So this is what God wanted to do. Canadian bitumen into the US. Now, we don't want to allow it to go through X Keystone XL. It will come through different ways. It cannot be stopped. Those who believe that by stopping Keystone XL, somehow they would stop the Canadians from producing uh, the oil sands, they don't understand decision making. These decisions are already in motion. For the next 10 years, additional volumes will come, whether we want it or not. So you have three things you can do with Canadian oil sands. Either you bring it down to the US, which is what God wanted this to happen, or you take it to the west coast of British Columbia to export it, and at that stage, uh, the First Nation um, uh, Indian tribes have committed not to allow one drop of um, oil to pass through to the west coast of Canada. Then the other option is to go a couple of thousand miles to the east coast and export it, which may happen. It may happen if it cannot come to the US, but it will come to the US. It cannot be stopped. The economics are too overwhelming. So. I think in a year or two, Mrs. Fee asking for additional comments on the comments, on the comments, on the comments on, on Excel, that means that we give up on it. We don't need it anymore. It will happen by itself. I know TransCanada will not be happy, but uh, it will reach the US with two or three years. The later it reaches, the bigger the dependence will be on the Middle East oil. That's the way the mathematics work. And when that volume coming, starts coming in, then the dependence on the Middle East slowly goes down. But we have to remember the Saudis have a million barrels per day of refining capacity in the US. Whenever they want to bring it in, they can bring it in. Of course, at the moment, 
they know that by selling it to Asia, they get a lot more money than they get from the US. So why would they come to $10 a barrel more? So they would have to be in the US only for political reasons. But they have the tools to make it happen, irrespective of the market demand. But of course, if they bring it in, they have to compete with the domestic crudes. And the Saudis are very savvy. Today, the Saudis are telling their partners in Shell that you can just buy from anybody. You don't have to buy my crude. But if you have to buy my crude, then I'll sell it to you at the market price of what competing crudes are. But they have the ability to show the US that the US still needs them. Although, in terms of the economic realities, may not be necessary to bring that crude. So, our view is that impact the Middle East crude, limited for the next two or three years, maybe four years, post 2017-18, I think Middle East crude needs in the US can go down slowly but radically over a period of time. So Canadian policy would be more important than domestic US policy as far as the uh, dependence on uh, Middle East imports are concerned. There is, the US provides strong competition to Qatar LNG. I mean, you know, sort of, uh, we all had assumed that Qatar would be number one for many years to come. Now Australia is gonna be number one and the US may go ahead of Australia. Uh, so there is, I think, big competition and big impact on the markets uh, of uh, the US exports and the way the US prices it. Although, people are realizing that the exports from the US are not creating liquidity in the market. Actually, you have to sell them on a 20 year contracts. So it doesn't really help liquidity, but it increases the total volume and the flexibility in the market. <laughs> Potential supply of LNG to UAE and uh, Kuwait. I think both UAE and Kuwait are looking at possibly importing from the United States. And I think they would like it, and I think US would like it. Maybe not uh, all their needs, but part of the portfolio. There is a real desire to make that happen. <clears throat> of course, the US has become a major competitor to the Middle East uh, refined product exports. Because uh, if you look at Europe, US exports to Europe are more important than the Middle East exports to Europe. Middle East is looking more at East, US has been looking at the Western markets. And of course, insofar as uh, gas-based petrochemicals are concerned, the uh, US can offer a significant advantage, particularly because most of the people in the Middle East who want to do gas-based petrochemicals are running out of gas. They don't have it anymore. The Saudis using LPG and NAFTA because they're running out of gas. They need the gas for power and they're already short. So in a way, the US on the basic petrochemicals would have an advantage over them. So impacts on Asia, of course, are great. Uh, crude availability for Asia, more African crudes are being offered because the US doesn't need African crude. Certainly, uh, more condensates will be offered, and the condensates will make a big difference to the Asian market. Large exports of NAFTA can happen from the US if we split the condensates. What the Asians need are NAFTA. Terribly short of NAFTA. A million and a half barrels per day we forecast shortage of NAFTA. That can come from either the condensate splitters or the condensate that the US sells that they would split over there. So between the NAFTA and the LPG that you can, sub can supply, the US can feed the massive petrochemical growth in Asia. So China now are exporting gasoline and diesel themselves. But before they can export petrochemicals, another 15 years left. So you have a much longer life to feed that. So LNG, LPG, these are the fine products, gas-based petrochemicals. These all have homes in Asia, and uh, many of them Asians would be happy uh, to pay for it. So here I've tried to uh, define for you what is the definition of the US power in the energy business, 
what are the impacts on different areas? And I've decided not to show you charts, because uh, if I have to show you charts, I have to bill you. Uh, so these are just the pointers uh, to tease you. Of course, nobody in Washington ever pays anybody, right? Uh, everything is for free. Uh, but there are significant possibilities uh, in, in Asia for the US volume of products. And the number one issue today is get the condensate definition right, get it out of the crude, and get it exported out of the US. And if you're not exporting it, then let the industry know so they can build the splitters and do it on this side. Uh, but uh, uh, being left in the sort of um, state of suspension, I think, is uh, not the right thing to do. Number two is, of course, the LPG exports continue. There is nothing anybody can do. It's just the time it takes to build the export facilities, the terminals. But it's already in motion and will make a global change in the system. And of course, on the oil side, get the Canadian story right. And that is, I think, has a huge impact. Now, I have talked about the Canadian oil sands. Uh, I have not talked about Canadian LNG projects. We have our friend from Alberta here, so he may uh, throw some rocks at me. Uh, Canadian projects are a lot more expensive than the US projects. And as of today, zero sales. Lots of MOUs and HOAs, but no firm contracts. The only firm contracts from the new players are from the United States, where people have committed to buy. And although they have to resell it, but they have to pay for it. And these are in motion. It can no longer be stopped. Uh, for Canada, the most optimistic project from my point of view is Progress LNG, which is led by five state companies. Petronas is leading it. It has um, Sinopec, Japex. It has uh, Indian Oil Corporation, Brunei government, and very soon Taiwanese government. So you have government folks which will go into this and make it as a strategic decision. If you have to make a strategic decision, then uh, decision making becomes much easier. The future, in our view, is a future with lower oil prices. And lower oil prices mean lower gas prices. So anybody develops a project, it will only work, in our view, if they can deliver to Asia at no more than 12 to $13 a million BTU. If you can't do it, then you should wait. And I think a lot of projects which are being discussed in East Africa, in Canada, in Alaska, will cost more than that. Nobody is going to pay you. The governments don't sell and buy. It's the private sector who sells and buy, buys. Korea Gas buys it, but they have to sell it to private companies. They go outside and buy themselves. So we should not believe that because the government, Chinese government can take it inside the system, but huge ramifications. PetroChina lost $6 billion of money last year on natural gas. Buy high, sell low. You can't do this too long, no matter how big and powerful you are. Bottom line is that we have to pay attention to economics. And if we don't pay attention to economics, things that people say they will do cannot succeed. If economics goes against it, the license from Adam Smith will not be given. And that is much bigger than FERC and DOE. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ferdinand, for, as usual, a great and provocative uh, presentation. Um, I didn't realize that we could no longer get the, the data for free. So uh, when did that rule change? You know, this, is, <laughs> this is very distressing. It's the American way. That's right, yeah. I've been in the US government. I was in the US government too long to uh, expect to have to pay for things when the time came. Um, so we've got time now for questions. I'm sure there are going to be uh, a number of questions, and there are many areas that you touched on that I think provoke um, people's interest. 
one of the ones that I'd like to start with is you sort of teased us a little bit in uh, saying that, well, it doesn't make much difference in what your crude price forecast would be without saying what that forecast was, except to say maybe it's going to be a little lower. A lot of debate going on now about the implications if we enter into a world where the U.S. becomes an exporter. Uh, and what, how does that change the trajectory? So I guess two questions. Um, how do you see the pathway, because we can't pay for it, you, can't, you don't have to tell us the price, but the pathway would be okay. And then how does that change if the U.S. actually enters the market as a uh, liquids exporter in a bigger degree? Actually, I don't think there would be a, a massive impact. If you export U.S. Um, bucking type of crude to the market, it'll sell in the market at Brent price. Uh, if the volume, and I don't expect a flood to happen, but uh, half million barrels per day, one million barrels per day in the market um, might reduce the price a dollar. I mean, it's not very dramatic. And the most of the exports which the market needs are the condensates. And the condensates will have a marginal impact on the crude price. So actually not dramatic. Our view about the crude price is that in the 80 to $90 range, depending on um, if things settle with Iran and Libya, could be this year. If it doesn't settle, then it'll be two, three years down the road. But it is a conclusion which is hard to avoid, that the direction is down. And $20, $30, Dave, makes a big difference. <laughs> big difference. Uh, for the conventional crude producers, who still, still spend no more than $30 a barrel, and most of them average cost probably still less than $15 a barrel. They're still printing money. But for those who have to do in the non-conventional, the massive rise in non-conventional costs would put many of them into jeopardy. A lot of LNG exporters would have to rethink the strategy. Those who want to build pipelines for gas would have to rethink strategy. And God forbid, renewable energy would have a very, very tough time with an $80 oil environment. But I think that we have a natural floor to the price of oil that we've never had before. I think $89 is a natural floor <coughs> because of the way it would uh, impact the non-conventionals. So we can go down, but $20, $30 make a huge difference in decision making today. Okay, so uh, let's open it up for questions. Just the, the usual ground rules. I get to say this one more time. Uh, please identify yourself, uh, your association, and then if you can, um, work it into a question. Uh, but if you have a statement, just make that's okay. But if we could end with a question mark, that would be great. So we'll start right here. We've got microphones that are coming up. I know we can hear you easily. But yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for the excellent presentation. My name is Paolo von Schirach, editor of the Schirach Report. I, I was wondering if you could uh, make some uh, uh, considerations which are a little bit off the subject, and that, and that is uh, the impact of this energy revolution on the American economy. And uh, in other words, is uh, sh the shale gas revolution and the and the non-conventional oil, North Dakota, et cetera, et cetera, a game changer as far as the U.S. economic uh, potential is concerned, or is just just one of the things that are happening that may, or as you correctly explained, you know, affect uh, global markets? And in particular, uh, some have speculated that the U.S. Uh, natural gas can be used uh, as transportation fuel in particular for heavy trucks. We're talking about the possibility, according to some estimates, of displacing three million barrels of imports. Do you see that as a realistic scenario? Does that make any changes? Does that really affect uh, U.S. imports from OPEC? Does that change something dramatically in the U.S. economy or not? In, in conjunction also, as you said, with Canadian uh, crude, Keystone, and all that. Thank you. Well, although I have a PhD in economics, I leave that to people who do macroeconomic analysis, and I'm sure uh, Adam Siminski and his group do this all the time. Uh, what does it mean in terms of the uh, employment and new jobs? I, I leave that out. In terms of the impact on transportation, um, I think the impact is heavily exaggerated in my view, uh, because at the end of the day, we have two things which determine uh, the trans 
just for transportation, the price of Henry Harp and the price of oil. Now, if we start exporting oil from the United States, then definitely the WTI price comes much closer to the international market. And if you have Henry Hub prices rise a couple of dollars, then it's not so attractive. Any study that we've done on LNG for transportation in the United States is so heavily dependent on small movements of price. As of today, it's very marginal. Very marginal. I think if you talk to the people who are doing it, I don't think anybody is making much money. But people have expectations. People have rushed into it, assuming that this is the new uh, major um, savior. Uh, after uh, one year of uh, frenzy, uh, we see it isn't. Now, if the oil prices keep going up and the gas prices stay down, it could be. But it could change very quickly. If you make a big investment in infrastructure, and suddenly you have this market's turn, which we believe will turn. We believe Henry Hub will go up and oil prices will go down. Now, how much will go up and down, we can debate. <laughs> but any directional movement would make the LNG for transportation and trucks not so economic. And if I've already made uh, several billion dollars of investment in building infrastructure, then I'm caught with it. So I think this uh, three million barrels per day, this kind of thing is, uh, I, I think it's just uh, pie in the sky. I would be very surprised if it becomes several hundred thousand barrels per day, in, in my view, until we have a clear understanding of where the markets will settle. And we don't know where the price market will settle until LNG exports begin the United States. Once they begin, then we have a few. I want to remind all of you that you know, what happened in Australia, the price of natural gas in Australia in the East Coast, when the CBM to LNG project started, was $3 a million BTU. They haven't started yet, but it's $8.50 today. And we are forecasting $11 by end of 2015 in Australia. Okay? Now, the Australian market is not as deep as the US, so we, we can't uh, say the prices will quadruple here. But it is, uh, I think, foolish to assume that everything leaves and everything remains the same. Uh, I just have a tough time buying that concept. But honestly, nobody knows. Because even the people, our clients which are drilling, they don't know themselves. This is just the beginning of the year. We will know in two or three years what happens to decline rates, what happens to liquids. Uh, but to assume everything is the same while we probably export close to one-fifth or one-sixth of the U.S. total consumption of natural gas and everything remains the same, I think it's uh, being extra optimistic. Paul Connors, Canadian Embassy. Your thoughts on uh, Russian natural gas supply, new pipelines getting to China or Asia markets and what that does to LNG in that basin? Next Monday, next Wednesday, Mr. Putin will be in uh, Beijing and uh, there is a 50-50 chance of signing right now. Uh, three months ago, the gap between the two prices was $5.50 per million BTU. As of two weeks ago, the gap is only $2. So, uh, and uh, the way it's worked is that the Russians have come down. I mean, they have started with the rack price, exactly what they're asking Ukraine, and then they came down. And uh, the Chinese went up a little bit. The Chinese wanted to pay what they paid Turkmenistan. They have to pay a little bit more. Uh, I think there is a serious chance of signing an agreement. Now, the volumes are also in question. Uh, it could be three to four BCF a day. So it could be 21, 22 to 30 million tons of LNG equivalent. The Russians are asking for 30 year contracts. The Chinese would like to have 15 to 20 years. This all has to settle, but at the moment, it's a purely political negotiation between Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi. That's really what's left to do. The people at Gazprom and the people at uh, CNPC have uh, said their things, their, their piece, and we have a clear understanding of what each of them want. But the gap should be bridged by politicians. Now, is it good for both sides? Well, actually, it's still exporting to Europe and getting $8 is better for the Russians. 
because the pipeline is already there. This is a huge pipeline. It could cost 20 billion. And it could take 10 to 15 years to build. From the Chinese side, it's not so good for them because once they get it, they commit it to 30 years. And we all know, we're all clever for five years. Nobody's clever for 20 years or 30 years. <laughs> Things change. I have seen it change many times. Things that I was sure is gonna continue reverse themselves. So to commit yourself when you are in stage of infancy with your shale gas development yourself, and you don't know where your economy will go, this big volume is a very dangerous proposition. But I would give it 50-50, and we'll know by next Thursday. Just to follow up, it'd be interesting to know, um, when you meet with CNPC and others, is that the advice you give them as well? I told them it's a bad idea. OK. <laughs> Good. Sarah? Thanks very much, Faridun. I'm Sarah Ladislaw here with the Energy Program. Um, OK, so. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and ask you a somewhat provocative question, which is always dangerous with you, because even straightforward questions, you give provocative answers. So I'm very interested in how this is going to go. Uh, so you've decided that God is on the side of markets, and Adam Smith is giving out permits. Right? But I've been at at least three or four conferences in the last probably two or three weeks that have somehow decided that the world is less about economics these days and more about geopolitics. And you've just given a few examples of where politics is weighing in and geopolitics very specifically on some big energy decisions. Do you think that's sort of a near-term trend that is associated with uh, the, the sort of events in sort of Russia, Ukraine right now and sort of the, the place we are there or do you actually see some long-term credibility to this idea that there's some feature in the market these days that are driving people to make more politically or geopolitically driven energy decisions than maybe the past 10-year period that we've been in? Actually, I don't. Uh, you know, if the things are close, then the geopolitics can push them together. But there are some things which are really stupid things to do. You, know, sort of, you can make bad things into good things by politics. I don't know, you remember how many times was uh, George Bush and Vladimir Putin shook hands about exports of um, oil to the United States from Russia? But it didn't happen because it shouldn't happen. And uh, certainly in the US, President Obama or President Bush is not buying any oil or not selling any gas. You have to make the economics of it work with private sector, no matter how much you can twist arms. Even in Russia, you can't go totally against the, the trend. So what the Russians actually are going to be, if they sign with, with China, the price would still be higher than the price they sell to Europe. But in Europe, the price, the net back is much higher because the pipe is already done. So I think that it's the dangerous proposition that we say that the geopolitics can solve our problems. It cannot solve it. And Washington is especially dangerous for this because you have all the congressmen, they say, well, let's make it happen. When are we exporting? Let's get them there. Let's get the, teach the Russians a lesson. You know, it doesn't work that way. Any LNG project from the beginning to the end, on average, is 10 years. You start to the end. You can't say, well, by the 2025, is Mr. Putin still there? Uh, he may be gaga by that time, or somebody else may be sitting there. Uh, who knows what happens to say that I do things, the impact of these things are uh, long, dated in the future. You know, I, I joke sometimes, people say that oil is like dating, gas is like getting married. Uh, in oil, you can change your mind, but in gas, you cannot. You get stuck. You need a mortgage, a house, children, uh, and the cost of uh, separation is very, very high. So you have to know what you're doing from the beginning. And uh, you have to leave room for price review. Of course, in marriage, you can't do price review. But uh, you stay in a relationship, you have to pay the price. But by the same token, production of oil can go into surplus because nobody who produces oil thinks about where to sell it. I produce it and sell it later. It's a fungible commodity. There is an anti-surplus mechanism on the gas side because you have to sign with the customer first. And even if you're a big boy, like some of the majors, it's still 70% commitment you want. If you're a small independent, you want 95% commitment. 
because otherwise the banks are not going to lend you. That's the bottom line of it. So you need the customers. So you can't have a surplus on the gas, but you can have a huge surplus on the oil side. So oil and gas are not brother and sister. They are distant cousins. It's very different behavior, different markets. And within this environment, the geopolitics, which requires long speculative sort of commitments, is far less important than on the oil side, where you can make a decision right away. Of course, the advantage of gas is that by the time the project happens, you're dead or gone, so nobody can be <laughs> held responsible for what they've done. Uh, but if you are governments, uh, you look for glory. If you're in the private companies, you look for cash. So some of these projects give glory. People will push for it and argue for it. But Two dollars, they can be bridged, but five dollars could not be bridged. I, I think it's interesting, sort of, as I look at the, back on the time that I spent in government and have my colleagues here, Frank and Guy and others, who went through the 1980s watching the divorce action in the gas market in the U.S., oh, I think yes. you can really co <clears throat> corroborate what you're saying, is it's very expensive to change that structure uh, once it's locked into place. Okay, more questions? Here. Uh, Bill Murray with uh, Energy Intelligence Group. I guess two questions. The first is, if oil is like dating in natural gas like marriage, what is condensate? I thought you were going to say, what are the portfolio players? <laughs> no, I'm not. No, condensate not that, not is uh, basically, it's, the beauty of it is that it's traded as crude. So the markets, it's sell it as crude. And there are three ways of pricing condensate internationally. One way is the Guattari model that essentially sell it Dubai-based, plus or minus. One is the Iranian model that you say it on the price of NAFTA. And one is the Algerian model that you say it on the price of netbacks. But so far, the highest prices have been obtained by making it crude-based. Because what you can do with condensate is that you can split the condensate, or you can blend it into crude, put the refinery, and produce more NAFTA. So there are a very variety of things you can do with it. Today, in the US, a lot of these condensates are just blended into crude. However, they get heavily penalized because NAFTA is not what the US needs. And the US refineries, they don't want it. And they, you can make the NAFTA into gasoline by putting more reformers, but you already have enough gasoline capacity, generating capacity from the catalytic crackers. So you don't need any more of that. So the incentives in the US to uh, make you valuable product out of condensate is very limited. And we've talked to all our clients in the US with the refiners. Nobody cares if it's exported, as long as it is above a certain level of API, which does not interfere with the world of glory that they have today. What about the idea that you were mentioning how uh, different, uh, the different relationships and markets should take precedence over the geopolitics that seems to be raising its head? But it isn't part of the issue that the, the U.S. market change and the way it relates to energy is the biggest deal in 40 years in, in the marketplace. And as a result, people are losing their footing. One of the things that came out in the report that you'll probably read shortly here from the CSIS is that Europe seems to be on the back foot under almost any situation uh, concerning energy and uh, that it seems to be and that that could have some really unintended consequences in terms of just politics in the future 20 years even between the US and Europe. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm not sure what your question is. What, what is your question? I understand what you say. But what it seems the shale revolution is actually creating a uh, disconnect between the US and, and, and Europe and, and, and confusion as to what the real causes of, of uh, political displacement is. I mean, the Russian-Ukraine uh, issue is actually about uh, European weakness but it's being viewed as weakness on the Obama administration and perhaps even viewed in Asia as that way in the Middle East. So well, there seems to be a disconnect. Talk about Europe as a European community, but I mean, it's not a real country. There are different places and they have different things and different policies. Yeah. And there are the economies which are in, uh, in long-term decline. So, you know, it's a different world. The disconnect between them and the US would have happened anyway without the shared revolution. 
Now, that, what this does is that it gives a boost to the US to go forward that nobody has the similar boost to give to Europe. So the gaps become wider. But uh, I'm not sure, you know, if the, what would have happened, let's say there was no shared revolution. Still the Europeans would be in the same boat as they are. The price of gas would be still the same. The dependence would be still the same on Russia. Whatever the US produces in energy has nothing to do with Europe. Europe is not a market. It's not going to go to Europe. There's no need for it. So what's the difference? What's the impact on Europe? Then? What's the impact on the US? <laughs> Are we talking about impact on the U in Europe or US? The US would have a boost, boost because of the cheaper fuels. The refiner can say, okay, the refiners in the US, many of them would have shut down, maybe, because they don't have the advantage. You don't have an advantage, but the, the separation from US and Europe in terms of gaps, in terms of the energy gap, I don't see how it's affected by the shared revolution. The boost to the US economy, yes, of course, is coming, but the Europeans would be exactly exact in the same place as they were before. If the US prices were $9 a million BTU for natural gas, it wouldn't help the Europeans. The US advantage of the competing in the market with Europe would have been less, but you know, US is in a competition with the powerhouses in Asia. Uh, Europe is a mature economy, to be polite. You know? <laughs> Some, some more questions, or surely with this group, nobody wants to reveal themselves. I think. Oh. <laughs> so, um, I know where you live. <laughs> so, Sorry, sure. It's possible that I may ask an additional question on the. Yeah. You mentioned in passing uh, shale development in China. Um, and of course we know, at least in terms of estimates, that there's plenty of shale all over the world, China being obviously the most important place with significant challenges for them, technological and, and geological, to develop it. There's shale in Argentina, shale in South Africa. Can you see, or is this a, too far down the road that is impossible to forecast a global shale gas revolution, which really, that then would really cause a real displacement for the traditional producers? keeping in, in mind what you just said about glut in LNG, et cetera, et cetera. If indeed China becomes a major producer, Argentina, et cetera, does that change things or, or is it, we simply don't oh, know? I think of course it will change, but you know, we're talking 15, 20 years. The issue I think we have to keep in mind that uh, the perfect storm is in the US. Nothing could be more perfect than this. There's no perfect storm in Canada. Canada still has to produce and transport it. You have the swimming pool, the Henry Hub swimming pool. It's a wonderful swimming pool. You produce conventional gas, you throw it in the pool. CBM, you throw it in the pool. Tight gas, shale gas, you throw it in the pool, it's all mixed up. And it has a life. It has its own life. If you don't export it, it has a market, it has a life. Export is an offshoot. And if it becomes bigger, it impacts the pool. But the pool is there. There is no perfect storm anywhere else. In China, you don't have uh, water. You have for deep, fracking. deep for fracking. You have to bring in water and you have to go much deeper than the US. Plus, it's all in the farms. The farmers are up in arms. Uh, in the areas of drilling, all the chickens have stopped laying eggs. Do you know why? Hmm. Tremors. In some of the areas, none of the animals mate. The farmers are really upset that since you're drilling here, my livestock is in turmoil. And in China, yes, of course, it's an important, uh, strong central economy, but the, the provincial issues are very important. So you can't rush this kind of thing. In the UK, of course, everything which is found is in the farms. The issues of to do it in the same way that the US has done is impossible. But can it be done over 10, 15, 20 year period? I'm sure it can be done. Then of course, most of the places is all dry. It's remarkable. You have some areas in Canada which are wet, but most are dry. The whole of the Horn River is bone dry. 
in Australia is all dry. Argentina, anything they found is dry. Poland is all dry. Now, we don't have enough history to know what else can be done. But uh, without the liquids, uh, I think, and without this fantastic infrastructure in the US, it'll be very slow. And we have to remember, this is a manufacturing process. In a manufacturing process, it takes time to do things. And you have to build in, in China, you have to bring in huge pipelines of water and then take pipelines of gas away in the middle of nowhere. So our forecast for China is that by 2030, 10 to 15% of the total gas production, not consumption, production will come from Shell. And later on, it may become more, of course, as the infrastructure is built. But it is at the moment just an American revolution. So, uh, okay, question there. Uh, Fred Lawrence, Independent Petroleum Association of America. Um, what are your thoughts about Mexico in terms of expanding the North American energy footprint? Um, not, not as much looking at LNG, but also uh, pipelines and you know, natural transportation and some of the opportunities that that will, that will bring for, for our energy market. Well, you know, I forget now, uh, is it four or six PCF a day of gas has been committed to Mexico in the long term? <clears throat> so maybe one day these pipelines will be reversed. Mexico will export gas to the U.S. We've seen this kind of things happen so many times. But um, today, Mexico pays as high a price for LNG as the Japanese do. $15 a million BTU they pay. They don't pay Henry Hop. They pay $15 a million BTU. Argentina pays $15 a million BTU. Brazil pays $15 a million BTU. But all these contracts are short-term contracts. Short-term contracts in LNG is defined up to two years. And medium terms, two years to five years. So you have short and medium-term contracts, but everybody assumes I'll get my act together. And they probably won't and will renew it but uh, I don't want to commit myself to the larger volumes. So the developments in Mexico, and we are now at the stage one of the new reforms in Mexico, and it's not done until it's done. You know, this is um, still uh, subject to many, many pitfalls. Uh, so if it goes forward, I think then they would take less from the US. They take refined products from the US. They take. Uh, natural gas from the U.S., these they don't have to take. So it has an impact in the U.S. I don't see them as exporting it to the U.S., but they could be a much important global player. I think they should rightly be as a, one of the earliest players in the global system. Uh, a lot of opportunities have been lost. So I don't see that there would be a huge impact on the U.S., but some of these markets will disappear. What we sell to Mexico today would have to be used to be exported outside other places. And I think they would be, it would happen. And uh, seeing how things work at a very slow pace in Mexico, I wouldn't worry about it for the next 10, 15 years. So I had uh, a couple more questions that uh, I, I was going to put on the table. Um, in previous discussions, you've talked about Qatar's strategy in terms of uh, selling LNG into the marketplace. I think the point you've made is their gas is essentially free when you take account of the, of the liquids, or close to that. So they, they have a country strategy not to overbuild. Do you see that changing? Because that can make a huge difference in terms of how the global LNG market evolves if they decide to now compete with new players and expand capacity. And then the other is we've gone almost an hour and a half and not talked about China and China oil demand. So uh, what's happening in that area, and what do you foresee, uh, for, say, the next 10 years in terms of the growth of, of oil dam? I, I, I know those are small questions, but. Okay. Well, um, on, the, on the Qatari side, the Qatari is uh, the reason they're not expanding, because it's not there. You know, sort of, uh, one day I was argue, uh, discussing with Herman Franson, and he was saying, but they have 900 TCF of gas. They can do a lot. So in the Middle East, all the countries, without exception, the numbers of oil and gas reserves, they just make it up themselves. There is no, no verification, no audit. We know there is a lot, so we accept it. But actually, there is no certified numbers. 
Uh, I remember the time when the Iranians said that I have 100 TCF of brass, and the guitarist said, I have 100. And then the guitarist said, I have 200, I have 200, I have 300, 300. Then I said, 500 I have. They said, I have 500 too. <laughs> and one day, the former minister, I think, had a little bit more, too much to drink, and he said, I have 900 TCF. <laughs> The Iranians said, oh, that's a bit too high. I stick to my 500. <laughs> that tells you something. Uh, but the reality is that you have one big plate, and two people are eating from it. One is hungry, and one is not hungry. One has stomach ache, cannot swallow. And that's the Iranian side. But when they eat, they will eat very fast. So the Gatari policy of keeping these volumes unchanged is the prudent policy. Is the right policy that I want to have, to, I want to know that I can supply my 20 BCF a day production for 20 years. So the idea of producing more LNG or producing more gas to be in the export market is not on. And in fact, uh, what they do is, I mean, what they do is that they essentially locked out, and I hate to say this, with Fukushima crisis. Whatever they wanted to sell to the US, they sold to Japan and at the immediate fear to Taiwan and Korea. 18 million tons committed in that market, which is about what they were hoping to sell to the US. So essentially, they, are, uh, they don't have that much extra. They have some volumes in the UK, uh, which I think they'd be happy to pull it out. They are in four or five arbitrations with Europeans at the moment. By the way, in, you know, Europeans always go to arbitration after every deal. You know, so it's a normal process. Uh, not one arbitration has happened in Asia on the, on the LNG business, not one. They think it's rude. When you promise, you have to do what you promise. The, so the Qataris, sooner or later, they try to move everything out of there and take it to Asia, but they don't want to do it in a way that disrupts the UK economy. Uh, so they, have, they don't have a lot of extra volume they have to worry about in terms of competing. They've already scored, and they sold long term. So until mid-2030s, they'll be okay. Now, on China, you know, sort of, we get lower percentages, but the absolute numbers are not that much lower. So base is becoming bigger and bigger. I think the demand growth in China, about 300,000 barrels per day, and an absolute number, which is the only one we care about, absolute number, we don't care about percentages. We impact, impact on the market is based on absolute numbers. This will continue for many more years. But in 2015, for the first time, we expect that the demand growth for oil in the Persian Gulf will be bigger than China. That China would be at 300,000 barrels per day, the Persian Gulf countries will go at 350. Of course, in Persian Gulf, um, they waste a lot of energy. You know, sort of. The more money you have in the Middle East, the more money you waste. Uh, your handouts, uh, low prices. The richer you become, the more subsidies you give, which is totally against the logic of uh, need for subsidy. You can be in UAE. The Indians, which come from India to UAE, this is a great situation. I pay one-eighth of the price of gas in UAE than I pay in India and one-sixth of the price of petroleum products that I pay in India with subsidized prices in this area. So uh, something is sort of uh, wrong with the logic here. The logic here is that if I have money, I have to give it out. If I have less money, then I don't have to give it out. The people, people, you know, these arguments people make about all oh, the budgets, and what are people going to do with the budgets? The, how the, the budgets in this country is, are not real budgets. If you have less money, you waste less money. And if you have less money, people don't come to you and say, give me a handout. If you have more money, they ask for the handout. So these budgets have no meaning. At some point it hurts, but I would be surprised if the, I think the price would have to be $40, $50, I'm guessing, before it really hurts. It doesn't hurt, less prices. You know, in 2010, the Saudi price in the budget was $50. So what happened between 2010 and 14? There has to be $95. You just spend more and you have less, you spend less. So in, in in the Middle East, the demand will go higher. So they will become larger than China. And I think the, any kind of lower price of oil, reducing subsidies, 
that would make a big dip impact on the global oil demand. Global oil demand is driven by the Middle East, by those who produce the oil themselves, rather than by the global market as much. So you have lower oil prices, then you become more rational. The best decisions in the Middle East are taken at the time of oil, lower oil prices. So then there would be less demand, and they may be able to export more. So oil is becoming a luxury good. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a, one, one, let's see if there's uh, two, time for two more questions. So one here, is there another one? Okay, so one last question. Hi, uh, Dave Adovanovich with Argus Media. You talked about exports of condensate and then the issue of the, the splitters being built here in the U.S., but I was a little fuzzy in terms of how you come down on the issue. Um, uh, with the demand for condensate in Asia, would it be more advantageous for the U.S. to allow exports of condensate, or would we be better off to go ahead and split the stuff and export the naphtha, which, from a balance of trade perspective, which would be more advantageous of for the course, U.S.? it would be much better to export condensate as is. As is, because you send it outside. The reason you do the splitter is, is because you can't export it. And let's say uh, I am uh, an investor, and we have many of our clients who are seriously thinking, shall I go spend the money? You spend the money, and then suddenly condensate exports are uh, allowed to go out. So there's no need for your business anymore. So you are at risk already. Now, these are not big dollops of money, OK? 100, 200 million for the condensate splitter. Uh, if you put some serious infrastructure in place, you're talking 3, 350. So it's not like a $10 billion liquefaction plant. You know, each of them could be 30 of these splitters. So, but it is a still a big issue that shall I make it or not? But some of the producers themselves, and I think that's more important, the producers themselves say, look, why don't I build the splitter myself? Once they do it, then if it's allowed for export, still they will split because they've made the money. They would look really bad if they build the splitter and then shut it down a year after. So you can have some of these guys forcing themselves to be linked in to the splitters after they build it. So if we can get the condensate story sorted out earlier rather than later, it would be better for everybody. Well, Feridun, I want to uh, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, it's always great to have you here to provide a bit more of market re realism in the uh, building of a geostrategic uh, uh, think tank. So um, thank you very much for those insights, and thank you for your long association with us. Thank you very much.